released on March 11th, 2014. This year, Hearthstone is celebrating a decade of being one of the largest digital card games available. From its strategic gameplay, its wacky and fun play style, or its high-quality art and graphics, there really is something for everyone. But there is one other aspect of this incredible game that often goes unappreciated by the casual player, and that is the game's story. On the surface, Hearthstone appears to just be a silly card game being played inside a mystical tavern. But, if you look deeper into the lore and characters within the game's many card sets, you begin to realize there is actually a connected narrative being expressed between them. So, to celebrate a decade of duking it out with cards in the tavern, let's put together the pieces of this story and assemble the completed Hearthstone timeline. Now, covering the entirety of Hearthstone's lore is quite a daunting task, and so I've decided to enlist some help for the project. Welcome viewers, I'm a Shadow, a fellow lore enthusiast who posts his knowledge daily on Twitter. So join us and take a seat by the hearth as we tell you all the story of Hearthstone. Before we dive into the story, let's first discuss how Hearthstone's narrative is told. A lot of the characters and plot of Hearthstone's universe is taken from the lore of another Blizzard game, the wildly popular MMORPG World of Warcraft. We play the game in the POV of an adventurer from WoW who just wants to have some fun in Hearthstone Brew's mystical tavern. This tavern is the one we see in the Harfen Home cinematic with Ava and Sarge. Hearthstone itself is actually a game within the lore of WoW, and so the story itself is separate from anything seen within World of Warcraft's canon. Finally, in the game itself, we also see Hearthstone cards, which means we are stuck in an infinite loop in the space-time continuum, which itself makes this explanation quite confusing. Let's just ignore that and get to the actual story. The tale told within the Hearthstone universe begins in the distant past on the planet Azeroth. Long before life inhabited this celestial body, a great pantheon of legendary beings known as the Titans protected the cosmos from many great evils, with their biggest adversaries being creatures known as the Void Lords. These beings of pure void wished to corrupt an unborn titan that lay dormant inside the planet's core, so they created and sent down parasites to latch onto and infect the world soul of Azeroth. These parasites were the Old Gods, and each brought waves of devastation onto the planet. So, the Titans intervened, imprisoning each and even killing the one known as Yashiraj. In the Hearthstone expansion, Titans, we see the outcome of this great war against the Old Gods. Specifically, we learn of yogg saron the God of Death, who, after his defeat, was imprisoned in a large facility known as Ulduar. Once the Old Gods were dealt with, these titans would leave Azeroth and create beings known as the Titan Watchers to protect the planet in their absence. However, some time after their departure, in the fall of Old War miniset, we see that yogg saron would manage to free himself from the prison, taking over all of Old War and corrupting the Watchers to do his bidding. While it is unclear what yogg sarons fate was after this, it can be assumed that the Old God was defeated once more. But word of these beings had already gotten out, and as their malicious influence spread across Azeroth, it would only be a matter of time before another old god would attempt to escape. This leads us quite nicely into our next major event that takes place during Hearthstone's only wild exclusive set, Cavern of Time. The story told of this expansion actually begins quite late into the timeline, when the bronze aspect of Zormu and Chromi notice a disturbance in time itself. They come to find out that Murazan, a corrupted version of Nazdormu, who had seen his own death, plans on releasing the Old God Cthulhu. The infinite dragonfly went back to an event known as the War of the Shifting Sands, bringing with them powerful beings such as Alakir to aid in releasing the God of Madness. Nazdormu decides to gather his own powerful allies from different points in time, like the League of Explorers, the Mischief Makers from Gadgetan, and a hero from a distant future. A Draenei named Rooney. We will learn more about her soon. In the end, 
the heroes were successful and were sent back to their timelines. Now, while the beginning of our story so far has solely taken place in the distant past, it mainly serves as a way to build up the history of the world. It is our belief that pretty much every expansion from here on out takes place within roughly the span of five years, with some sets even taking place at around the same time. Characters and events then tie these expansions together in the overall story of the Hearthstone universe. And it all begins with a great scuffle between both goblins and gnomes. The story of Goblins vs. Gnomes helps bridge the gap between the ancient past of Azeroth and this new present day story. For example, cards within the set such as the Spare Parts and Mimron's Head show exactly what happened to all that Titan tech seen in the Titans expansion. It also acts as a great introduction to one of the most important reoccurring characters of our story, the mad, doctor, blast master, and most recently inventor, Boom. Dr. Boom started off as a simple boom engineer, creating many explosive weapons, mainly boombots, for his fellow goblins. But after the events of Goblins vs. Gnomes, he would soon become so much more. So much more he became that he was able to open an entire lab of his own. And so, the Boomsday Project was born. What was he searching for? He doesn't know, but he wanted to see things go kaboom. Okay, so before we begin, the Boomsday Project is an expansion that happens at a single point of the timeline, but rather one that extends from now until the start of Rider Shadows. The Boomsday Project sets up a number of important events, such as Experiment 3C to run away to the Witchwood, Boom Master Fork Betrayal, and the creation of Clone Boom. During the free Boomsday comics, Boom basically creates a con of himself to be able to charm his crush for him. The plan goes flawlessly, except he isn't the one who's actually going out with her, it's his clone. So he decides to destroy his clone, but he gets overpowered, and in a last ditch attempt, he does something extremely silly, telling his clone to self-destruct. And eventually he wins! In the end, his crush, which is the same character from the Bomb Squad Corps, invites him into an evil plan that happens the very next day which leads to a much bigger event, but more on that later. One of Dr. Boom's greatest inventions of the entire Boomsy project was the mechanically augmented Duraxis, turning into the fearsome Mecha Duraxis, who quickly be then escaped the Neverstorm and began to cause some mayhem of his own. On the planet Outland, Mecha Duraxis began his universal conquest. He created an army of mechanically augmented demons known as the Rusted Legion, who stormed the planet, converting any who attempted to rebel into mechanical servants known as the Prime. Even the powerful Naga, Lady Vash, was struck down on Outland and turned into one of these Prime Warriors, which is a notable difference from her death in WoW's story. But as the Rusted Legion terrorized the planet, one group of outcasts stood to oppose them, led by a powerful night elf named Arana Starseeker. After braving the wastes and sacrificing it all to become a demon hunter, Arana, alongside her band of outcasts, managed to defeat the Rusted Legion and kill Mecha Jaraxxus. But while all this mayhem was happening on Outland, what exactly was happening on Azeroth? Following at around the same time as Ashes of Outland, a semester at the Magical School of Yore had just begun. As many students of the prestigious Scalamance Academy begin their studies, a dark secret is being kept from them all. The school's headmaster, Kelfuzad, is secretly leading a cult of necromancers right underneath their noses. One of his personal favorite pupils is the extremely talented Tamsin Rome. We'll see more of the fate of Kelfazad and his schemes, as well as what Tamsin gets up to later on. But as our time at Scalamance was coming to an end, the Headmaster had plans for one last field trip to celebrate the end of the school year. This of course leads us into our next expansion on the timeline, and the conclusion to the Year of the Phoenix's storyline, Madness at the Dark Moon Fair. On the Isle of Dark Moon, a twisted theme park can be found, Made by the great Silas Darkmoon, this fairground is built with very suspicious imagery reminiscent of the old gods. Seemingly their presence is also afflicting the park 
and driving it into madness at the Dark Moon Fair. The fair was also the chosen place of Skullamance's field trip, where both individuals from the school and members of the Rusted Legion from Outland competed in a high-speed race. The right hand of the deceased Mechadraxus, Envoy Rustwix, even brought some of the Rusted Legion's prime minions to act as his pit crew, and daughter of Keymaster Alabaster, Ivory represented her school and her old man in the race. King Rostokan decided to host a tournament, which would put up nine lowest and nine competitors against each other in the Rostokan arena for the glory. Among the crowd was a passionate troll named Rikar, who always had dreamt of participating in a tournament like this one. He saw the opportunity and stole the mic from one of the announcers and proclaimed to the crowd that he was a champion of the Rumble and that his lowest were the crowd themselves. Then. The Loas decided to try to persuade Rikar to join them, but who he chose is left vague as he decided that in the Rumble Run. What we know though is that Voom didn't win, as he had an accident with dragons. Now why exactly is Rostokan Rumble here of all places? Well it's because of one extremely important character, good old Suit Bender. What? You don't see how this random card is important? Well, the Soup Bender is actually part of the Tusker Bros, a company that resides in a very unsafe city that will later appear in this timeline. They sell a great amount of funnel cakes and soup! They were supposed to ship a giant cargo of soup to Northrend, but it accidentally went to the Stranglehorn. They were worried that it wouldn't sell as well, but the trolls really loved buying the soup. Not to eat, no, but to throw at each other during the rumble. We'll see more of the soup lore soon. Going into this next portion of the timeline, it is good to get some context into what this age entails. The Age of Heroes shows the origins of some very important heroic characters in the Hearthstone universe, and it begins with the story told during Hearthstone's Year of the Griffin. This year contains the sets Forged in the Barrens, United in Stormwind, and Fractured in Alterac Valley, and it tells the tale of ten mercenaries split into two factions, the Alliance, and their sworn enemy, the Horde. Our story begins in the Barrens, a landscape full of danger and the home to the Horde. During an event known as the Night of Falling Stars, a being known as Anaru is split into multiple pieces and scattered across the Barrens. On this night, an old troll shaman named Brukan had a vision. He saw two dragons twisted together, as well as a light and darkness merge. And finally, he saw the symbol of the Horde, Triumphant. In another location, Rokara, a young orc warrior, finally decides to leave her family to join the fight for the Horde. She is sent to the Barrens by Gerash as a way to toughen up, under the guidance of Rukan. During their adventures there, she helps another old troll named Kazakus obtain shards of the Naru and gathers a party consisting of Rukan, herself, a loving Tauren druid named Gothrun Totem, Gordon, clever blood elf mage, and Tamsin, a forsaken warlock with an odd sense of humor. Together, they go to the Wayne Caverns and free an orc druid named Neralax from the Emerald Nightmare and are able to obtain some kind of weird Naru shard. On the Alliance side of the story, we miss Arella, a loving Draenei mother that lost her husband in a terrible accident on Axodar. They left her daughter caught in a coma that no healing magic could break. She too witnessed the night of falling storms and had a different vision. The Naru itself, Mita, spoke to her directly, telling her to gather the pieces so she could save her daughter's life. Compelled by this, she went on her own adventure in the Barrens, teaming up with the Hunter Dwarf Tavish and his pet Krabby, and the SI7 agent Scabs. Later on, she would also align herself with the Vengeance Seeker Demon Hunter Cartress and Cariel, a paladin who abandoned her post after hearing her sister who went missing during an invasion of Undead in Scalamance, who was spotted in the Barrens. While traversing the Barrens, Scabs, Tavish, and Tyrella fought with Vord and Dongrasp and Kazakus ending in Dongrasp's capture. Meanwhile, Cariel and Kurtrus fought and defeated a group of demons named the Burning Blade, 
who were protecting Tamsin, Cario's forsaken sister, and something called the Demon Seed. The warlock got away without any sense of mercy. She really didn't care at all about the lives at stake there, but now Cario knew what a monster she had become. After successfully surviving the barons, our Alliance mercenaries all unite in the capital of the Alliance, Stormwind. There, Thyrella, Tavish, and Scabs imprison Dongrasp in the stockades, a prison complex that holds many enemies of the Alliance. Hearing about what happened to them, the Horde Gang embarks on a quest line to save Dongrasp. Firstly, the Horde arrives in Stormwinds and begins to raid the docks. But during the chaos, Tamsin breaks from the plan and decides to show her true colors. She subdues her quote-unquote friends and goes to the Stormwind Chapel to fulfill her true mission. Use the Demon Seed to summon the Dreadlord and Neveron to get vengeance on the people of Stormwind. In her path to the cathedral, she confronts Irella and forces her into accepting her own shadow magic. At the top of the building, she concludes the ritual and starts a demonic invasion. While all of this was happening, Scabs heard from one of his contacts. You might know this guy, the, the old retired SI7 agent Bob? Something fishy was happening in the Stormwind Court. The gnome decided to investigate to try finding the imposter and uncover that Lady Prester was not only working with the Horde and Kazakas, was also uh, a dragon? After uncovering this, Scabs was promptly arrested by Prester and was sent to the stockades with Warden. Now going back to the demonic invasion, the many armies of Stormwind tried directly stopping Tamsin, but it was futile. The warlock was too powerful, so they decided to retreat, except for one night, who, with an undying determination, knew that he needed to stop his own daughter. It was Cornelius Rome, Tamsin's father. Tamsin had no remorse. She then made him forget his own memories and burn his mind deep enough so he could and then finally decided to delete any remains of her sister's memory from him. Seriously, Tamsin, you're not okay. Regardless, Cario saw what was happening with the city and rose to the occasion, giving an inspiring speech to the Stormwind army, improving their morale, giving them a chance to fight back against the assault. Tavish defended the Dwarven district. Cursors joined forces with Cario in a touching moment and got the vengeance he so desired by killing the Dreadlord Neveron in the final showdown. But Cario had one last mission, one she could only do alone. She went into the cemetery and found her sister alongside a remain of her father. Cornelius was turned into a mindless abomination that started attacking Cario. The paladin ended his suffering, allowing him to finally rest. In rage, Cario stood off against Tamsin and engaged in an intense battle, which culminated in Cario slaying Tamsin for good. While all of this is happening, Varden and Scabs escape the stockades in an unexpected duo. They tell their comrades that Kazakos and Prestor are actually working together and are smuggling tons of Noro shards to the dead mines. The Alliance band goes there first and tries defeating the pirates, but can alone. In an unexpected twist, the Horde mercenaries join them in a fight, and together they defeat the Defias pirates. Also, fun fact, this is canonically the second time Sneak got his ass beat in the dead mines. What a loser! Finally, they discover that the shards are being sent into Ultrak, but the two sides still fight over what they should do, and are fractured in Ultrak Valley. Our final expansion of the mercenary story sees Tavish go back to his clan, the Stormpikes, to get some aid. But his cousin, Vandor Stormpike, isn't that friendly and only helps him after being defeated in a duel. This leads into some conflict between the Horde and the Alliance, which culminates with a face-off of the entire Frosthold army against Tavish and Cariel, which are holding the Dumbledore Bridge. In the battle, they notice how strange it is that Rokara and her friends aren't there to be seen. But be careful! Cario is thrown off the bridge, searching for her. Tavish finds Goff and the Horde mercenaries fighting against Kazakus. He and the Alliance gang decide to help them defeat this old troll, who reveals that he's also a dragon! They really like their dragon fakeouts, huh? Kazakuzan, 
had assembled all of the Naruto shards and with his newfound power resurrected the world of Tamsin, now as a Dread Lich. He then took off with the Dark Naruto in his hands and left Tamsin to face the adventures. Rukan blacks out of the battle and we skip to the Horde Gang resting near a campfire. There they have a touching moment together with what they have learned so far. They enter the Cold Tooth Mine and join forces with Karyo, face off Taskmaster's Nivel, killing him and opening a vacuum of power for a certain new Cobalt King. Rukan then finds a Primalist, which tests him with the memories of his deepest fears to see if he's worthy of summoning the Ice Lord Lokolar. They use his powers alongside Ibis, like seriously, somehow Guff was able to tame the Alliance Giant to stop the conflict in the valley temporarily uniting both forces to stop the Dreadlich Samson. Rukan instructs all of his allies to flee. Everyone obeyed, except for Karyo, who couldn't let the old troll deal with her sister alone. In his last moments, Rukan sacrificed himself to finish off the warlock for good. With the Dreadlich defeated, Dongras went to the city of Silvermoon and convinced Lothramar to run, to persuade both factions to finally put an end to the dragon's plan and it's then that the mercenaries team up and travel to a large underground lair that they found out belonged to Lady Preston, who was not just a dragon, but the brood mother and daughter of Deathwing, Onyxia. After a harrowing battle, the mercenaries managed to defeat Kazakuzan, causing him to flee and potentially find somewhere to start anew. Onyxia, on the other hand, decided to stay, which ended up being her downfall. Mounted on the fastest griffins of the Alliance, Zyrella and Dongras flew with the Naru to save Rooney. However, two were intercepted by Onyxia, which was raided with the Void's hatred. The battle was intense, but in the end, Onyxia was finally slain. When they reached the Exodar, Zyrella worked on purifying the Naru, but all seemed to be lost, as Mira had been totally consumed by the Void that the dragons had used earlier. The Naru, however, sacrificed themselves with their last bit of light to save Zarela's daughter Rooney from her coma, and in the end, the mother and her child were united. The Blood Rock Company is a great business that extracts Ezrai from the region known as the Badlands. Under the thumb of Sheriff Barrowbrim and Raska, the promise of riches in the place was so well known that a wild statue rogue named Reno Jackson decided to apply to join under the miners' wing. He was assigned a job, dig down the outlaws, a group of bandits that supposedly were harming the Tonspies. When confronting them, a famous priestess night elf by the name of Elise Starseeker persuaded Reno to switch sides. What he didn't know was that the sheriff's business was quite shady, so shady in fact that multiple elementals were being awakened by the harm done by the extraction of Azerite in the area. Teaming up with Doc Holliday, Rhea Straza, and Gunslinger Curtis, my boy, which is the reason we know of the Badlands placement, they conducted a successful tramp heist and blew up all of the mining site. After a while, a weird portal to Deep Home was opened, where weird earthen elementals popped up. Both the townsfolk and the outlaws had to team up to hold back the primordial situation. In that place, they found Bran, the leader of the Explorers League, and Turfinley? who has some weird fish-shaped weapon which is surely not an important timeline-breaking detail. Together, they decided to form the League of Explorers we know today. Our next portion of the timeline consists of the Free Adventures, Nax Ramas, Black Rock Mountain, and the League of Explorers. These adventures see the proper introduction of the newly found Explorers League, and show how during the events of these adventures, we are actually playing as a recruit of the Explorers League. While raiding the tomb of Naxxramas, we defeat that Lich Kelfazad I mentioned earlier. Then we scale the rigid cliffs of Black Rock Mountain to slay the dragon Nefarian. And finally, we follow Bran, Elise, Finley, and Reno, teaming up alongside them to defeat the arc thief Rafam and his hordes of undead. But this would not be the last we'd see of the Supreme Archaeologist. So now, of course, following these free, we have the one other adventure to release. One Night in Keraza! Well, um, actually... Night of the Frozen Throne happens first. You might be asking me how this expansion even fits in the timeline, and here, 
of all places. Well, dear viewer, there is an important character that I bet none of you even know. That's right, it's our boy, Bloodfan Raptor! <clears throat> uh, wrong, free to. Uh, oh, oh, right. I mean, Pampas Faspian! Now, viewer, I know that you're even more confused, but bear with me. In the comics, we learn that the events of Knights of the Frozen Throne aren't actually a canon thing that happens. Rather, it is a compilation of tales that Thespian tells in the tavern. The main guess of his narratives is that the classical heroes of Hearthstone somehow end up in a scenario that makes them fall to the Lich King's power, be it their own will or being forced to accept it. This is a stark contrast compared to what happens later in another tale of his. Nevertheless, Vespian gets super famous from these stories. So famous in fact, that he will even get invited to join the biggest party in all of Azeroth. Okay, yeah, technically that is correct. So it's Knights of the Frozen Throne, and then the last of Hearthstone's adventures, One Night in Karazhan! The Grand Magus Mediv has invited all sorts of celebrities from across Azeroth to join him for a magical party in Karazhan. They party so hard, in fact, that while it may have originally only lasted one night, the party technically continues to the end of time. But don't worry too much about that. The first expansion that then follows these adventures is, ironically, Journey to Ungoro. Elise returns to lead a platoon of junior scouts into Ungoro Crater. We know this set takes place after the events of League of Explorers, because Elise the Trailblazer's flavor text mentions Reno teaching Elise that blazing her own trail is more fun than following someone else's map, obviously referring back to the old Elise card from the League of Explorers adventure. In this expansion, we also see two very important Silver Hand recruits named George and Carl, who get lost in the jungle, never to be seen again. Well, that is, until we encounter them again in our next expansion on the timeline, Kobolds and Catacombs. After a young kobold by the name of Togwaggle is granted a great candle crown by Rafam, he is made into king of the kobolds. Immediately, he instructs his fellow kobolds to dig a vast subterranean network of caves, believing there to be heaps of treasure. And he was right. But as soon as word of the catacombs got out, Adventurers were quick to raid and loot Togwaggle's fortune. George and Carl can also be found in these tunnels, confused and completely lost, as they tend to be. These two would at some point even lose each other before finding escape. In the end, after all of Togwaggle's loot had been plundered, he was left to be king of nothing. But soon, he would be given an opportunity to enact revenge and steal some loot of his own. After the amount of success in their tales, our go, Pompos Thespian, decided to do what any greedy storyteller would do. A SEQUEL! March of the Lich King represents the Battle of Silvermoon, a reimagined and exaggerated by Thespian. So, just to get to the point, the Battle of Silvermoon did happen, but not exactly as we saw in this expansion. Why is that? Well, firstly, Next drama is happening before its expansion is a big tale, as Orphos only came to the Sunwell to create Kalfuzad's skeletal body. So that order got messed up. And the other point is that the Lich King only obtained their helm in the actual war AFTER this battle. So it wouldn't make any sense for them to have it here. Also, I just wanted to mention that we put this expansion right after Kobolds, just so Scourge Illusionist made sense in the story as they were the Cabal Illusionists. Anyways, I do think that some points here are canon, like Ongrasp taking part in the battle as a Magister, the Curator upgrading to the Purator, who only started attacking the undead because they wanted them not to get in danger, as they saw the unliving as part of their own menagerie. In the end, Silvermoon fell, but not all were slain. Many like Lord from Arthuron, Dongrasp, and Romaf survived, but the city was in ruins. After some time, the adventurers finally defeated the Lich King. And with the Lich King defeated, Tyrion Fordring decided to celebrate their victory with a royal competition. One might even call it a grand tournament! 
knights and nobles from across Azeroth gathered to compete in a series of jousts and battles to claim their own glory in the presence of the rulers of the land. Even the King of Stormwind, Varian Rin, was present as one of the tournament's judges. And as the competition came to its end, and the world finally seemed to be at peace, all the people of Azeroth were able to rest again. Well, not everyone could rest. As there was one city that never slept, and something was beginning to stir between the different factions that ran it. After the events of the Old Griffin, Kazakos hid himself in the crime-ridden city of Gajitzan. There, he started a new and even created a faction of alchemists called the Cabal. Known for brewing Kazakoa, some kind of weird soda that is totally safe, another one of the established factions is the Jay Lotus, a group of mostly Pandoran that are led by Aya Blackball, a young but cunning leader. They have a weird museum with some big green men, but don't worry too much about that. And finally, the last of the three factions, we have the Grimy Goons. Led by Don Hancho, they are the smugglers of the city, bringing weapons, beasts, and a lot of money to Gadget's end. These three have one shared contact, Madame Goya. If not for her, the entire city would have fallen apart. Another key piece of the timeline is the return of the Tosca Bros. During the Gadget's and Gazette, we learn in an advertisement that they are an established company in this prosperous city. However, we later discover that they were caught up in an investigation regarding peddling fraudulent foodstuffs. An unpaid and wholly independent investigator blames Mayor Nogginfogger and states that several customers of the mega market became seriously ill due to the lack of regulation in the shops, allowing hucksters like the Tusker Bros to sell substandard funnel cakes to the public. In the end, their shop was forced to be closed and replaced with the ice cold Kazakola. This downfall might have resulted in some kind of conflict of the bros against the Cabal, which ended up in one of them appearing in Castle Nathria. Finally, it is worth mentioning that the Grimy Goons are finding a suspicious band somewhere. The story of the Witchwood is one that is a lot harder to fit into the overarching narrative mainly because there are not many characters that help connect it to a specific part of the timeline, with one very big exception, that being the shaman and very namesake of the Witchwood, Hagatha. It is unknown exactly what happened to Hagatha to turn her into the cursed blight of Gilneas. All we do know is that she has a bubbling hatred for the city. And so, after putting a bounty on the witch and her ensemble of horrors, including the famed Baku who devoured one of the two moons of Azeroth, monster hunters flooded into the woods. Some in it purely for the gold, others to prove their might, and some just hoping to find themselves. Heads up, the following events happen in no particular order, and I just compiled them this way for a more storyline-like feel. So first, Tess Greymane, faced off against Captain Shivers, a vengeful spirit that was once slain by Gen, Tess's father, resulting in Tess finishing what her father started. After beating the pirate, she obtained a clue about Hagatha's whereabouts. In another corner of the woods, Houndmaster Shaw tracked down Galinda, the leader of the Crowskin Cult. The sorcerer mocks Shaw, saying that if he knew Hagatha's power, he'd heal like his dogs. However, Shaw prevailed and obtained another clue to the shaman's location. Even deeper in the woods, Darius Crowley raged battle with his mighty cannons against the traitorous Lord Godfrey. The battle resulted in Darius finding a hint at Hagatha's lair and Lord Godfrey's death. Finally, in the darkest corner of the Witchwood, Toki clashed against herself from the future? A small tangent, but there's a famous theory that's floated around in the Hearthstone community that Infinite Toki actually comes from the timeline split that we later witness in Descent of Dragons, originating from the havoc caused by a certain ethereal in the Evil Path. But regardless, her efforts were in vain. Or were they? Don't think too much about it. As our Toki won against herself and found the last piece needed to find Hagatha. In the end, Hagatha was tracked down by these four brave hunters, and was defeated by their combined teamwork. But as she fled the woods she called home, 
Hagatha swore she'd get her revenge. Whispers is an interesting expansion, in the sense that it doesn't really have a specific time frame that it happens. The expansion is just a compilation of stories that the mystic Madame Lazul has gathered to terrorize and intrigue the clients of Harf's Tavern. She's an acolyte of the old gods, spreading their wicked whispers to her fortunes. What they don't know is that some of those whispers are true, and that Lazul is actually a faceless disguised as a troll. Weird stuff. In a tent, just outside the floating city of Dalaran, a group of villains gather and plot revenge on the meddlesome mortals that mucked up their missions. The arc thief now turned arc villain Rafam assembled a league of evil to enact his plan for vengeance and world domination. Rafam first approached Lazul. Impressed with her stories and abilities, he entrusted her to find more like-minded individuals. She then called on Togwaggle, Hagatha, and Dr. Boom. Together, the League of Evil plotted a grand heist to take the entire city of Dalaran. Knowing they can't do this alone, the League of Evil enlisted the help of many lackeys to help in their schemes. We even see the return of George, who after going a little crazy in the catacombs after losing his best friend, has joined this League of Evil. Togwaggle then broke into the city banks. Hagatha freed the prisoners of the Bylit Hold. Lazul made havoc in the streets, all while Dr. Boom strapped giant rockets to the side of the city. Finally, Rafam faced off against the most powerful mages of Dalaran before successfully booting them out and taking control of the floating city for himself. With their new joyride, the League of Evil set off to enact their schemes, as this story had only just begun with the rise of shadows. The League of Evil's next portion of their plan had them fly Dalaran to the middle of the desert to the Titan facility of Old Doom. There, they released the Plague Lords, large beings composed entirely of ancient plagues that, well, plagued Old Doom. With the city now left in chaos, who would be able to save them? Well, none other than the League of Explorers, returning once more after hearing of Rafam's antics in Dalaran and now Old Doom. This group of heroes dusted off their hats and charged into the fray once more. The League's first stop was the Lost City, where Reno went face to faces with Vesh, the Plague Lord of Murlocs. The battle was harrowing and nearly saw Reno defeated, but he was able to tip the scales in his favor and Finn-ish Vesh off for good. Following that, Finley traveled into the scorching desert in search of Kazrath, the Plague Lord of Madness. While wandering, Finley stumbled into the lost paladin Carl, who seemed to be looking for someone. After hearing what was going on, Carl decided to pause his search and join the explorers in their mission. Finally, after reaching the outskirts of the Plague Lord's lair, the League managed to find an extremely powerful weapon known as the Scales of Justice. And with this weapon in hand, Finley was able to easily defeat Kazrath. But now, the League faced their biggest threat yet. In the tomb of Kartut, Elise had a brush with death as she battled Zatma, the Plague Lord of Death. But by using her wits and the power of Osiren's tears, Elise was able to kill death itself. With four of the Plague Lords defeated, there was only one left protecting the Inner Sanctum. Bran Bronzebeard traveled through the famed Halls of Origination, and after gawking at all the Titan artifacts, he fought his way through to Icarax, the Plague Lord of Wrath. Bran cracked his knuckles and whip as he quickly dispatched the last of the Plague Lords. Quickly, the League regrouped and readied themselves for their final battle against Rafam's lead henchman, Takan. As they entered the Inner Sanctum, they quickly made a shocking discovery. Takan had been transformed by a fifth Plague of Old Doom and had become the Plague Lord of Flames. With his newfound power, Takan fought the explorers, but he alone could not defeat them. He pleaded to Rafam for help and to uphold his side of their deal, to which Rafam betrayed him 
abandoning Takan and absconding from Uldum with what he had came for. Together, Reno, Finley, Elise, and Bran killed Takan, putting a stop to the League of Evil's invasion, and were henceforth known as the Saviors of Uldum. But just because Uldum was no longer in trouble, that didn't mean their job was done, as the League of Evil had already taken off once more with the city of Dalaran and were heading far north. In the region of Northrend, just outside of Wormrest Temple, the League of Evil parked the city of Dalaran and got ready to enact the final step of their plan. But before they could, the League of Explorers had caught up with them on massive sky ships of their own. Rafam, however, anticipated this and shot the Explorer's main ship out of the sky. As our heroes plummeted from the sky, it was clear that this must be the end of their story. Until suddenly, dragons descended from the skies, swooping up the explorers, and thus a massive aerial conflict broke loose, as dragons good and evil fought on both sides of this massive battle. Using the chaos as a good distraction, Rafam proceeded with his plan, as his henchmen fought the explorers. It is during these attacks that we see Lazul defeated by Finley, and killed as she gives her life to resurrect Gorath, a servant of the old gods. George and Carl also reunite here, as Carl is able to get George to switch sides and stand with him on the side of good. And finally, Dr. Boom even manages to defeat Reno, capturing him and taking him back to the Violet Hold. And here, well imprisoned, Rafam finally tells Reno what his true plan was all along. He would now use the Secret Plague of Undeath to resurrect the dragon progenitor Galakrond and take over the entire tri- <coughs> planet, um, the entire planet. But surely Rafam couldn't have succeeded in the end, right? Well, he technically does. In one of the two possible endings for this final adventure, you can see Rafam actually managed to resurrect Galakrond and wreak havoc across Azeroth. But after everything is destroyed, Rafam decides Galakrond is now too dangerous to be left alive and defeats Galakrond himself. But in the second, true ending, we instead follow Reno in one final battle against Rafam. During this fight against good and evil, Reno taps into a secret power that he didn't even know he had, as it is revealed that Reno Jackson is secretly a dragon? Come on! Okay, we've done that reveal three times now. But anyways, with this power, Reno defeats Rafam and Galakrond once and for all, thus concluding the Year of the Dragon storyline. Sardin Aphrius invited tons of influential guests over all the Shadowlands to a great feast in which he would speak over the rumors of his involvement with the Anima Drow. When it was his time to speak, the lights flickered. His callus fell to the ground. He was dead. The ten prime suspects looked among each other, and so chaos ensued. Until a Murlockian figure appeared. It was the famous detective Murlock Holmes and his amphibious psychic, Dr. Waffen. Together, they solved the case that the Nephrius had actually faked his death to get away with stealing anima for the jailer's plans. Because the Nephrius got away scot-free, the corrupt judge declared Sylvanas as the main culprit for the anima drown. Nathanos fought hard at her defense, but the prosecution, led by the Miltranix, won in the end, and Sylvanas was found guilty. Fun fact, Russell, the bard from Cobble the Catacombs, and Elise both appears in this expansion as typewriters for Reverend of News. Now, our next expansion here is actually one that takes place both towards the end of the timeline and also the beginning. But for the purposes of this, we decided to focus on the more present day story seen in the actual expansion itself. Phelan, a night elf of the ancient city of Zinashari, wishes to return to his home. But there is a slight problem. Zinashari was flooded many years ago and now rests at the bottom of the ocean. And so, Phelan instructs a powerful gnomish technician named Eni Stormcoil to build a submarine called the Leviathan. Phelan, Eni, and Sir Finley, who also wished to tag along, traverse the ocean deep on a grand voyage to the sunken city. 
After dealing with the many frets that they encountered on their journey, the crew of the Leviathan finally arrive at Zinashari, only to learn a dark truth. The people of the ancient city still lived, but were transformed into the Naga, serpent-like creatures that served the old gods. Together, the crew of the Leviathan faced off against the Naga, narrowly escaping with their lives. After the events of Boom's Day and the Year of the Dragon, Kangor, one of Dr. Boom's greatest scientists, decided it was time to lead a new life, far from the madness of his previous employer. And so he began to pursue his true passion in life, dancing, and signed up to participate in the greatest musical competition of Azeroth, the Festival of Legends. Icons from all over have gathered in Thousand Needles to compete and be crowned the true champion of music. One such band is Blightbor, a group of death metal forsakens consisting of Cagehead on the guitar, John Graves on bass, Fiddlesticks rocking the drums, and their lead singer Devlin Styx. There was also a number of soloists who joined the competition, such as Rockmaster Voon, who enlisted in the festival after his dragons abandoned him in the rumble due to some unknown incident. And finally, we have Poison Bloom, a suspicious boy band led by the egotistic Hedonis. Though seemingly just another innocent band on the surface, there is certainly something shady going on within this group, as the group was actually founded by the notorious crime boss of the grimy goons, Don Hancho. The group was completely manufactured in order to cheat the competition, with members of the audience even being paid to cheer them on. But among these musical legends, there was also one really obsessive fan of the festival who even entered themselves into the competition, facing off against the icons they admired, and eventually the Tauren, the myth, the legend, ETC. After beating ETC in one final musical standoff, they would learn the true meaning of music and be crowned the newest festival legend. And finally, our timeline comes to its conclusion with Hearthstone's latest set, Whizbang's Workshop. No, really though, the last expansion released happens to also be the concluding expansion of our timeline. And this isn't just coincidence either. You see, Whizbang's Workshop was an expansion made to celebrate 10 years of Hearthstone, with the set itself taking place in the magical toy store of the Splendiferous Whizbang. It was this setting that allowed the designers to make callbacks to iconic characters, with cards depicting them now as collectible toys. Meaning for our timeline here, this set must take place after all of these characters have gained notoriety in the world of Hearthstone. Enough so for them to become merchandisable. Heck, there's even a cycle of cards dedicated to characters that are literally nostalgic of past expansion mechanics. All of this is why we think Whizbang's Workshop is the perfect cap to the story of Hearthstone, showing off the wacky and whimsical nature of the game while calling back to the fan-favorite characters from the story. Hey there, Post Bionic here. So while Whizbang's Workshop was indeed the final expansion on the timeline when writing and recording this, since then we've had another expansion announced and released by the time you're watching this that takes that spot. Perils in Paradise is now the final expansion on the timeline. Many years after his adventure in the catacombs, Marin decided to open his own resort in the Spiral Isles. Narcissistically called the Marin, this rogue teamed up with the Blood Cell Pirates to create a totally legitimate tropical resort. Though with less than welcoming denizens combined with perilous locations, coming to this island would really be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The reasons for this expansion falling at the end of the timeline are mainly the same as Whizbang's. The set sees the return of tons of previously featured characters, like Lynessa, Patches, and even the Noggling from Sunken City. There isn't much evidence for it coming before or after Whizbang in-game, but we do see on the set teaser that Vol'jin was traveling from Whizbang's workshop to the Spiral Isles. Definitely isn't solid evidence, but it is something. Either way, I wanted to take this opportunity to throw in a prediction for what we'll see in the Perils in Paradise miniset as it is yet to be revealed. My prediction is that we will see the return of Togwag, who has come to take his revenge on Marin, as he and his pirates were the ones who plundered his treasure from the catacombs. 
with Merrin himself even stealing Tolan's goblet from the Kobold King. And with that, we have now covered the complete Hearthstone timeline. Our timeline we decided on may look different from your own, and to be fair, some sets can likely be moved around, but in the end, the goal of this project was to show how much thought and effort is put into even the story of Hearthstone. And I hope you all come away from this with a newfound respect for that. I want to thank Macadogs once again for their time and help in making this timeline, and for joining me in the video. You can find them over on Twitter, at Macadogs, of course, linked in the description. They post some amazing and fun lore facts every day, so please go check them out. And thank you all so much for watching. This was a gigantic project, months in the making, so I really appreciate you checking it out. If you really enjoyed the video, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to you liking and subscribing. Okay, I gotta get this video out before another expansion gets revealed. So, as always, hope to see you all again very soon.